hello everyone. You got a little bit of a snippet of a, converse, a casual conversation with myself and um, today's speaker, Dr. Priscilla Wald, and I'm going to jump in to the formal introduction. Um, so I'm just so pleased for those of you who are in attendance and pleased for those of you watching on Facebook live streaming um, or in the previously recorded session, thank you for being here. In the future, in a post-pandemic world moving forward, um, we are hoping that we can have these conversations live with our invited speaker. So um, before explaining what the Cox Family Speaker Series is, I do wanna acknowledge that this is the week anniversary of the Boulder shooting that happened at a King Supers in Boulder, Colorado, which is, of course, where the University of Colorado Boulder is situated. And there are many people in our community who are really hurting. We had a moment of silence at 2.30, which is the time when um, the shooter opened fire in the King Supers. And so I really just want to begin with, I hope people are finding ways to care for themselves and others at this time. It's, it's been a very difficult time for so many of us, especially um, with the shooting coming on the heels of the Atlanta shooting. And we're all under a lot of stress. We're all trying to cope as best as we can in, in teaching and in doing our intellectual work in the midst of a global pandemic. So um, before kind of formally opening, I just wanna really acknowledge that I understand that everyone is holding a lot of things right now. So thank you for taking time to be here in this space because I know that I've really, appreciated the book group that is attached to this speaker series as a way to really be in community with others and to have something that we could focus on, you know, again, intellectually, but that, that also had relevance to our world. And so let me actually begin by explaining that the Cox Family Speaker Series is a new series that the Center for Humanities and the Arts has developed out of donations from the Cox family. And I do see in our participants list that um, Dr. Jeffrey Cox, who's chair of the English department is in attendance. So I wanna thank him and his family really formally for the funds um, for this speaker series. And I also wanna acknowledge that Jeff was our inaugural director for the Center for Humanities and the Arts. So the idea behind this speaker series is that we invite an established artist or scholar in the arts and humanities to talk about a work that they're known for. Um, and so our speaker today, uh, Dr. Priscilla Wald is very well known for this book, Contagious. Um, and the idea behind the series is, is for this um, invited artist or scholar to talk about the work in terms of the inspiration um, behind what, what got them to create the work, um, the reception of the work, um, anything that they might edit or change, right? Because we all, I mean, I think all the scholars in the room know this. After something's published, we think, oh wait, I wish I'd been able to dot, dot, dot. Um, and, and the reason we selected Contagious as our first book, I think is not gonna be a surprise to anyone. We are living in the middle of a pandemic um, where contagion narratives abound. And as this was happening, I thought I'd really love to know what Priscilla thinks about this. I think a lot of people thought that because I think she was very popular in the early months of the pandemic. Um, and I'm just so pleased that she's here with us. So I'm gonna do a very truncated introduction because if I were to introduce the full breadth of her accomplishments, you would just be hearing from me for about 10 or 15 minutes. So um, I wanna begin by saying that Priscilla Wald is the R. Florence Brinkley Distinguished Professor of English at Duke University where she teaches and works in US literature and culture, particularly literature of the late 18th to mid 20th centuries. Um, she also works on contemporary narratives of science and medicine, science fiction literature and film, law and literature and environmental studies. Um, she is at work currently on a book length study entitled Human Being After Genocide. I would imagine there's gonna be some connections between Contagious um, and the book project she's working on. A very truncated glance at um, Dr. Wall's professional service includes being co-editor of American, the journal American Literature, chair of the faculty board at Duke University Press, senior editor for American Literature on the advisory board of the Center for Humanities and Medicine at the University of Hong Kong. She has served as president of the American Studies Association and on the National Council of that organization, as well as on the Executive Council of the Modern Language Association. And I have enormous respect for my colleague, Dr. Priscilla Wald, but I am also connected to her through friendship. And you probably gleaned that through our, our earlier conversation. 
um, and particularly through canine parenting. So let me just quickly share this anecdote. When my husband and I were looking to adopt a dog over a decade ago, we went through a fostering agency in Durham, North Carolina, and we were told to call Joe and Priscilla. Um, so I called the phone and this woman answers, says she's Priscilla. The voice sounds familiar and sure enough, it's the Priscilla Wald on the other end. And at this time we had met, but we weren't friends. You know, we were friendly with each other. Um, I knew her certainly more from her scholarship than, than in person, but that early canine parentship help lead to a friendship as well as, you know, these monthly meetings that Priscilla would have at her house for those of us in the Triangle area that were interested in American studies. And the reason I want to bring up her foster dog parenting is that um, I know most of you will know Priscilla through her work, but, but the breadth of generosity of who she is is really encapsulated in the fact that she is one of the most busy academics that I know, and she takes time to foster dogs. So without further ado, let me turn things over to my friend, Priscilla Wald. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I am sharing my screen um, and trying to remember how to make this. Ah, right. Whoops, sorry, a little technical difficulty. There we go. Um, and I want to start by um, thanking the people who did all the work to get me here, Sharon and Kat and Max and Jen and Danny. So thank you very much. And thank you, Jennifer, for uh, inviting me and for the lovely intro. But I also want to, um, before I begin, to acknowledge how, um, what a great idea this is for a series. And um, kudos to Jennifer for thinking not just about people giving talks, but I think something we don't do enough of in the profession, which is sharing how we do our work. You know, it's so easy to, to read somebody's book and, and just think that it somehow came whole cloth from their heads. And writing is a, is a wonderful, exhilarating, and very difficult process. Um, scholarship, all of what we do. And, and I just think it's great that Jennifer is doing this. And and uh, you guys at Colorado are so lucky and we miss her so much in the triangle. So um, I am going to do this in four, probably three parts, just because I've been working all day to cut it down and, and haven't been as successful as I wanted to be. So in the first part, I'm going to talk about what an outbreak narrative is and how it really my method, how I went about identifying this thing that I ended up calling the outbreak narrative. The second part, I'm gonna, that's the longest part. Second part, I'm gonna talk about the inspiration, how I came to the topic, um, how it evolved. And I wanted to talk about two turning points or two obstacles, two places where I stopped and, um, and how I got started again. I'm not sure I'm gonna have time to do that. I'm gonna watch the clock pretty carefully. Uh, so if not, I welcome questions about that in the Q&A. And then the last part is just very quick. Um, how will we tell the story of this pandemic? And that includes something I wish I had known, very just a small point, but I think a, an important one that I wish I had known um, when I was writing the book. Okay, so with that, I will launch in. Um, so I, I came to this topic in the mid 90s and I had just finished uh, my, my book, my first book, Constituting Americans, had just come out, which meant I had time to like re-enter popular culture and go to the movies, which I love, and read magazines and, and you know, whatever came my way. And I went to see the film Outbreak, 1995, lower left corner. And I re it blew me away. And not that it was a great movie, but I was so intrigued by the plot, which is about a catastrophic communicable disease and um, you know that threatens the human race or human species or whatever we are. Um, and I was really intrigued by this. It's a mystery story. It's got a lot of action. Um, but also because it picked up on some questions I had been left with at the end of Constituting Americans that I had been looking into. And I'll get to that a little bit later, but it was really interesting to me how this late 20th century really picked up on the turn of the 20th century, the late 19th, early 20th century questions that I had been asking about um, medical authority and contagion. Uh, once I went to, uh, to that film, I started looking for, uh, I started, well, I didn't even look. 
that I just noticed a proliferation of um, popular science journalism and uh, genre fiction and magazine articles that were on the same idea of this thing called disease emergence. And I got really curious about what it was. And gradually my research, my reading led me to a 1989 conference. So this is in the mid nineties. So about five years earlier, a 1989 conference that was organized by Nobel laureate microbiologist, Joshua Letterberg, who will be a presence throughout this talk from start to finish. Um, who organized this thing um, really uh, at the end of a, of a decade in which HIV had made its way around the globe. And in the 1970s, medical science was really people working on particularly notions of infection, tropical disease, um, communicable disease, et cetera. Uh, they were really sanguine after in the late 1970s, the eradication of naturally occurring smallpox. And doctors were saying, you know, or researchers were saying, yeah, communicable disease is not going to be a threat to humanity anymore. We've really got this. We're, we're on the track to just making it, you know, manageable and never threatening. But of course, HIV punctured that sanguinity. And it also called their attention to a series of, of uh, really uh, catastrophic communicable diseases that were new, that had, hadn't been experienced before, uh, hemorrhagic fevers like Ebola, Marburg, Bolivian hemorrhagic fever that were popping up in remote locations. But because there was such a um, short incubation period and because they were so catastrophic, they were, although devastating to their communities, pretty easily contained. But there was a lot of fear that, you know, what if Ebola went airborne or something like that? Um, these were really diseases that, uh, that there were very few precedents for. Um, and this group of people decided that this was all part, this and HIV and these diseases were all part of a phenomenon that they called disease emergence. And that it was the consequence of globalization and development patterns that on the one hand, the world was growing, the population was expanding rapidly, people were moving into areas that humans hadn't lived in before, and they were encountering microbes to which human beings were immunologically naive, right? No herd immunity. And at the same time, the world was shrinking. We were increasingly interconnected, moving uh, goods and people more ra rapidly than ever around the globe, um, and everything was becoming very, very interconnected. And so they said, you know, th these aren't just problems for medical science, these are social and geopolitical problems, and they really have to be dealt with that as such, how we treat each other, how we inhabit the planet, that, you know, really we have to address this uh, to prepare for what Lori Garrett, wonderful science journalist who wrote about this conference, that's how I found it, uh, called the coming plague. Um, so what I did uh, was I had already noticed these, um, these were not new images, but I noticed a real proliferation of these visual images and plot lines and vocabulary keywords that uh, proliferated radically in the wake of the 1989 conference. And I began to pay attention to where these things appeared and how they worked. And so I'm going to now go into exactly how I identified the outbreak narrative, how I came to see it as a narrative and what it is. And I'm gonna start with a slightly less than five minute clip from the whoops, opening of the film Outbreak. Um, notice the epigram from Joshua Letterberg that will appear in a moment. The single biggest threat to man's continued dominance on the planet is the virus. And uh, that's gonna come back. And the other thing to notice is what's called the establishing shot at the beginning. It's a bird's eye view that slowly goes into a place. And I began to notice that that too was a cinematic convention of outbreak narratives, both um, fiction and nonfiction. And they were part of the pathologizing of place that I'll be talking about in a moment. I will now be quiet. You can look at
can deal with. But this strange disease. Thirty men dead yesterday. Eighteen the day before. We need supplies. Plasma, penicillin. We'll get you everything you need, Doctor. You Americans. Please, give me hell of this shit all. Hey, buddy, that's what we're here for. We're gonna take you home. But first, we're gonna take a little blood sample, all right? I'm gonna die, right? No, you're not gonna die. Tell my girl I love her. You're not gonna tell her. You're gonna tell her yourself, all right? The soldiers inside are in the early stages of the disease. By tomorrow night, they will look like this. Oh, God. I'll authorize an immediate airdrop, Doctor. Mm -hmm. It's even worse than I thought. Get the plane here by 1900 hours. Well, shouldn't we at least... Get the plane, Billy. So that is the opening scene of Outbreak. And um, what I realized, I obviously didn't know this when I was first seeing it, but what I realized uh, after I began to do research is that that scene really crystallizes the basic features of the Outbreak narrative. Um, so first of all, it has to be something really apocalyptic. Obviously, a, a, a film is not going to be made about a cold circulating um, you know, through a, a global network, although that could be an art film in its weird way. Um, so it has to be really species threatening. Um, it, it is uh, the, the danger, the threat consistently moves in the outbreak narrative from the global south to the global north and expertise moves in the other direction. And this is, I think, a really interesting, this shot, really interesting image of what I mean by expertise. So the Zairean doctor is telling them that, you know, the men they're seeing are in the first stages of the disease. And within a day or two, they're going to look like this. He opens the tarp. We prepare to see something grotesque. The camera does a 180 and we're looking at it mediated through Donald Sutherland's visor. And the idea is that this person, this expert um, from the global north knows how to assess what he's seeing. He knows what to do about it. And of course, what does Donald Sutherland do? He realizes, given that um, we live in a network, given that this has a real danger of getting out of this camp and needs to be contained, he authorizes a drop saying these people are casualties of war. And what the film does is not really challenge that, but he challenge, it challenges who can be casualties of war. So we leap forward two decades. We're in the present of the film in a Northern California town. This same uh, um, virus has gotten loose in the town and Donald Sutherland wants to nuke it again. And uh, he says, well, these people are casualties of war and the, the uh, challenge comes back, but these are Americans, sir. So here we have it. We've got the um, geography of disease moving from the global south to the global north, expertise moving in the opposite direction. Uh, the idea that the world is a network and that this thing needs to be contained. And finally, who can be casual casualties of war and who can't be? So those are the basic features of the outbreak narrative. And I now want to share my methodology, how I went about identifying um, and nuancing and figuring out what the appeal uh, of this narrative was. 
So um, what I did was I really immersed myself in the science and I began to notice what were the conventions? What are the things that came up time and time again in the science writing? What did science journalists pick up on? And then what did the genre fiction pick up on? So what was consistent across these three areas um, that I was noticing? So I've already talked about the apocalyptic nature, the interdependence, and the geography of disease. And in addition to the movement of South, North, and North, South, it's also a question of border crossing. So this is all about anxieties concerning globalization and the idea that national boundaries aren't really holding against the threat of disease, which then becomes emblematic of all kinds of other threats. I did want to point out how it gets picked up in the mainstream media and Richard Preston's Hot Zone, which is nonfiction. My students often refer to it as a novel because it's so novelistic and he is a novel writer but it's nonfiction, made a big splash in 1994 when it came out as a New Yorker series and then was a best-selling book uh, for many months, as was Laura Garrett's much more, um, I think, responsible, less sensational uh, coming plague. Um, Joshua Letterberg was actually behind leaking the story that led to the hot zone, which is all about an outbreak of an airborne Ebola strain in a primate facility in uh, Northern Virginia which turned out fortunately not to be, um, uh, humans were not susceptible, it was a primate virus, but had it been as they feared something that transmitted to humans that would have been uh, disastrous. So Preston writes, um, a hot virus in the rainforest lives within a 24 hour plane flight from every city on earth. All of the earth cities are connected by a web of airline routes. The web is a network. Once a virus hits the net, it can shoot anywhere in a day. Paris, Tokyo, New York, LA, wherever planes fly. I happened to read this book on a plane. It was very, uh, it was pretty terrifying. And uh, it was a real sensation at the time. Lori Garrett's Coming Plague, as I've noticed, noted, was I think a more responsible book. And she was the one who picked up on actually reporting on the 1989 conference and warning, doing a full analysis of um, the problem and uh, of this emerging, what she calls the coming plague, what we're living through now. Um, the one thing I do want to point out, and, and that paragraph summarizes the argument of the conference. What I want to point out though is her use of the Andromeda strain, which is of course from Michael Crichton's 1969 novel, 1971 film, which was about what looked to be, turns out not to be, a virus that was absolutely deadly and devastating and was seen to be a threat um, to humanity. Um, and one of the things I noticed is how often that metaphor came up in the science, how many scientists talked about the, these hemorrhagic fevers as the Andromeda strain, but it was interesting to me that particularly in the US scientists, it almost invariably was used in reference to African um, viruses. And um, I find this interesting because Michael Crichton's novel takes place in the US Southwest. And uh, there was a hantavirus, which is one of the hemorrhagic fevers outbreak in the US, in the Southwest, the exact landscape um, that he writes about in 1994. But as far as I have found, nobody talks about it as Andromeda strain. So it's very interesting um, how these words get used and why. Um, for me, probably the most salient, most important of the metaphors uh, that I write about is the animation of the microbe and the metaphor from science of microbial warfare, which again, proliferated everywhere. I don't think I found more than two or three um, out of every probably hundred uh, science pieces. I, I, well, okay, I'm exaggerating, whatever. Many, many, many uh, use the metaphor of microbial warfare. And it's certainly something I'm sure you've all heard uh, used in reference to um, SARS-CoV-2, what we're living through now. And the idea of the microbe as an enemy, um, we're at war with our virus, et cetera. Um, and that metaphor comes up all the time. I'll be talking about it as we keep going. But I wanna point out something that Joshua Letterberg noticed, which is the difficulty of human beings accepting evolution, accepting the idea, and this goes back to his epigraph, the idea that, um, that something as simple and unthinking as a virus could actually wipe us out. Uh, and I speculate, and I am very clear that this is just speculation, that one of the reasons that it's so useful to think about microbial warfare is it gives much more dignity to humanity to think of something cunning and wily and calculating um, that 
that is at war with us rather than something that's incidental and just out there. Uh, it's also the case we have institutions and funding possibilities if we think about um, war that aren't necessarily there for other things. Nonetheless, uh, it's a very problematic me uh, metaphor for reasons I'll explain. One of them being uh, what we've seen, the anti-Asian violence that we've seen, how readily um, viruses can get identified or microbes in general can get identified with populations um, that, well, with populations and particularly with racialized populations. So note Barbara Culleton, another very responsible, very fine science journalist referring to soul virus. And first of all, the name, right? Taking from where this is a haunt virus from where it happened to have originated or first been noticed. Um, referring to soul virus as an unwelcome immigrant, a cousin of Asian Hantin virus. And I think one of the things we've seen from a very irresponsible politician, I won't name, um, who referred to China virus, Wuhan virus, Kung flu very publicly, it's really easy. And, and not the only reason that we're seeing violence against a, a population, but it's very easy to move from that kind of metaphor to an identification of the disease with particular populations, and they are invariably racialized. And while in the past, um, you know, there were national rivalries, like, you know, centuries ago, VD was referred, venereal disease was referred to as like the French disease by the English and the Italian disease by the French and whatever. Now we really tend to hear uh, these viruses named specifically for places in the global south. Um, and as I said, the hantavirus that hit the US Southwest was not named for that location. So I find that very interesting. Um, and I don't have time to go into this in detail, but whenever there's some kind of enemy, um, so in the Cold War communists, viruses tend to pick up the name of that enemy and get identified with it. Post 9-11, I saw a real, identi a real uh, uh, identification of viruses as terrorists and terrorists conversely as viral. And now I think we're back to immigrants and the immigrant threat. And I don't think it's an accident that uh, immigration and immigrants have become, again, a prominent metaphor for these viruses. Once the virus has been animated, it's very easy to make it uncanny and paranormal, uh, supernatural, um, and give it a kind of mystique, especially because viruses in particular challenged in the 30s to the 50s when they started to be able to be visualized, challenged our notion of living and dying. And again, I can go into that in Q&A if anyone's interested, but they do pick up this, this uncanny, even uh, admiring mystique. And it's a very easy step from there to um, having them be sort of the earth incarnated or the handmaidens of violated earth seeking vengeance for what humanity has done to the planet. Um, and one of the things I've noticed in the fiction is how often viruses are seen as kind of eco-terrorists, they, you know, these animated viruses, or uh, there are many uh, cases where there are human protagonists that are environmentalists that are deliberately seeding outbreaks in order to winnow um, the, po the human population uh, on behalf of, of an aggrieved planet. Um, so again, this came from the scientific uh, writing that referred to the earth as in the quotation I have above, and Carl Johnson was one of the people who attended the 1989 meeting as um, the earth being a progressively immunocompromised ecosystem. Um, and again, that's a metaphor I see that this kind of body metaphor for uh, the planet. And again, look at how Preston picks it up. The biosphere may not like the idea of 5 billion humans, or perhaps the human species is just so much meat that cannot defend itself against a life form that might want to consume it. The Earth's immune system, so to speak, has recognized the presence of the human species and is starting to kick in. Um, and what I love about um, using genre fiction is it acts as a kind of magnifying glass. And so I see these, these metaphors in the science like microbial warfare. And if I point out a metaphor, you know, I might say to somebody, you know, have you noticed how often scientists use uh, microbial warfare? And people say it's, it's just a metaphor. Everyone knows what we mean. But one of the things I've really learned to trust is how metaphors both register 
the way we're thinking about a problem and also um, instantiate it, really uh, uh, proliferate it, make it, make it a prominent way um, of thinking about the problem. And what uh, happens in genre fiction is these metaphors often become dramatized as full-blown scenarios. So we literally go to battle. The heroic epidemiologist scientists literally go to battle with these animated microbes that are trying consciously to destroy the human race. Um, and they, they're in an apocalyptic battle for the fate of humanity. And I see this as mythic. And one of the things that didn't really get picked up as much about my uh, book was this element of it, this kind of mythic um, sense that I was noticing in these, um, in these narratives. So it makes sense to me that, of course, the outbreak narrative and the social narrative, the geopolitical narrative would get picked up because this is a little more amorphous. But one of the things I noticed was that this really fit the, I'm thinking of Eliade here and others, Levi Strauss, the anthropological definition of a myth. And what I think again is that in the in the um, face of globalization and alienation, the idea of like an apocalyptic battle that gets won is not only cathartic and reassuring in a you know sort of more realist sense, but also has the effect of kind of rejuvenating uh, our sense of humanity. And I can get more into that if you want in the Q and A. Um, but I do want to read you a passage from um, Chuck Hogan. This is one example of what I'm talking about uh, in terms of, of um, being able to, uh, to look at the metaphor as a full-blown scenario and see what the implications are. Uh, and this is a really fun novel about, um, fun in my definition of fun, um, about a, there's a, a, one of the protagonists is an environmentalist who contracts this, um, of course, in Africa, contracts this uh, uh, hemorrhagic, this fatal hemorrhagic fever, but he gets a, an attenuated version and he's slowly converted to being a kind of human viral monster hybrid, which is a very uh, typical character in a lot of these novels. And there are two CDC researchers, one of whom is named Merrick, who are trying to track him. They call him patient zero. He's seeding outbreaks. He's winnowing humanity on behalf of the aggrieved earth and, uh, and they're tracking him. So look at the sentence at the bottom here. The threat of a mutant virus gifted with human intellect and cunning posed hazards exceeding Merrick's worst imaginings, but all he envisioned was its one great advantage. Epidemic control had never been simpler. Zero was like a tumor Merrick could go in and surgically remove. And you know, look at what has happened with the outbreak narrative. We've ended up with exactly the, the scenario, the narrative that the 1989 conference was trying to challenge, right? They were saying, we can't just think of this as a problem for medical science. We really need to change our day-to-day -day practices. We need to change how we're inhabiting the earth. But what those metaphors do is return us to this, um, you know, problem that medical science will solve. And that's the mythic battle uh, that I'm talking about. Um, I'm going to be go through this really fast so I can get to the inspiration part. Uh, but, you know, I've, I've told you how the genre fiction works. This is how it works uh, pretty typically in a more sedate form in the mainstream media. And this was from the last SARS outbreak. Um, it was a May uh, 5th, 2003 special issue of um, Newsweek magazine that was about the SARS pandemic once it had been basically contained. And these uh, photos were on a facing pages with the um, caption that I printed above, uh, linking them, fear of SARS prompts a Lufthansa crew to wear masks in the Hong Kong airport. The virus may have been born on a farm like the one above in Guangzhou, China, where animals and people live close together. And then it gets picked up in the, um, in the article. Uh, they talk about people living cheek by jowl on the district's primitive farms, as though these are people who don't know any better. Um, they have these primitive practices and they're right near Guangzhou, a teeming city that mixes people, animals, and microbes from the countryside with travelers from around the world. You could hardly design a better system for turning small outbreaks into big ones. So what is the story here? First of all, that this is somehow primitive, that people don't know better when in fact it's really an image. If people are living cheek by jowl with animals, it's an image of poverty, not primitivism. 
um, and poverty doesn't originate in the global south. It's a global, it's a problem of corporations, most of which have their headquarters in the global north, in fact. Um, and that's not the story we're telling, right? We're telling this uh, very truncated story. So once again, the thread is moving global south to global north. In the body of the text, they talk about how uh, scientists in the US and Europe genotyped and, and contained the threat, not, not nearly talking enough about the fact that it was in fact a global um, uh, consortium that, uh, that cooperated, that came up with that. But, um, and ultimately that it is a problem of medical science and medical science will solve it and not getting into this question of um, you know, where the problem really originates and the ways in which global poverty is the biggest single vector that turns an outbreak into a uh, pandemic, into a global pandemic. None of that discussed, none of the much larger issues of structural racism and structural violence. Um, so uh, that's basically the, the story of the outbreak narrative. And now I want to talk quickly um, about how it emerged, where I got my inspiration. Um, and I said, I had finished my first book, uh, Constituting Americans, and I always want to acknowledge the wonderful, brilliant Alan Grossman and the amazing essay, The Poetics of Union and Lincoln and Whitman, um, who one throwaway sentence in this brilliant essay gave me my, uh, the germ of my idea for my entire first book. Um, so I, I always like to acknowledge that. And what he talked about was in the Dred Scott case, the um, uh, decision by the Supreme Court, and this was turns out to be true of three cases, all with non-white plaintiffs, uh, where the plaintiffs were declared neither citizens nor aliens and therefore could not, um, they were not persons in the eyes of the US Supreme Court, US law. And so what I investigated in that book was I wanted to understand our ontological investment in the concept of nation and what its consequences were. And what I ended up talking about, and I wanna go through this quickly because so I can get back to contagious, but what I ended up talking about was this haunting image of the law, both in terms of what the law could create and how the law could potentially do this to any citizen um, and what that meant, but also that what I had gotten really interested in uh, in this book was the ways in which um, the legal system and our political institutions generally were really precarious. And we've certainly seen that with, you know, on January 6th and before for the past four years, how these things, you know, if people don't obey them, they, uh, they don't have any traction. Like, you know, if, if our former head of state uh, decides he's not going to obey the law, what's going to make him do that? So one question I ask is like, what holds us to things like law and uh, institutions and nations? And what I discovered was that it wasn't that the precariousness wasn't getting hidden, that there was a really interesting thing that happened in a legal case and a legal case, some legal cases and legal cases are often where a kind of contradiction and particularly with the Supreme Court, a contradiction in the fabric of, of our ideology can't get resolved. And so it goes to court and there are competing narratives over you know, how, how we're gonna understand it, where it's gonna fall. And what I argued is precisely that precarity is what makes us obey the law because it's so terrifying to think about living without it. But I, am, I discovered that I was really intrigued by these liminal moments, these moments of, of real tension where everything comes to the surface, precisely because it shows us more uh, poignantly or more uh, dramatically than anything else, how the sausage is made. Like what, you know, how are things held together and what is holding them together? And also because I think those are moments with real potential, not only for insight, but for change. And I have in the, the left corner there, um, Paul Clay's uh, angel, uh, which Walter Benjamin invokes and calls the angel of history. And I'm thinking of Benjamin's essay, uh, Theses on the Philosophy of History, where he talks about memory flashing up at a moment of danger. And those moments, those liminal moments where you see how everything is put together and the kind of violence of that, the exclusions, the consequences, these moments of insight that quickly get covered over again um, are moments that 
I'm really interested in. Now, the reason I've gone into this is two things. First of all, I think it's really important when you work on a book length project, um, it's really important to ask yourself like, well, you know, what are my real interests? What do I wanna really understand? Not just in terms of my academic project, but about the world generally. Um, and because uh, what had emerged from me um, coming, out of contag uh, coming out of Constituting Americans was that even more than law and political institutions, what really gave these things teeth was when there was also a medical dimension, a real material threat, a physiological threat. So it was one thing, you know, there were a lot of, I was looking at nativist um, conflicts and so forth. And, um, and what I discovered was, wait a minute, so this is, this, uh, this nativism is, um, is really, you know, the, the people who are anti-nativist who are saying open the borders, when there was a threat of contagion, uh, they, they were less likely to argue that. Uh, and I see that I'm basically out of time. So I will just very quickly, I'm gonna do this in like three minutes. Um, I got very interested in the story of Typhoid Mary and how that story was about, again, one of these conflicts between, um, you know, or, or how public health raised this conflict between uh, protecting the private rights and privacy of citizens on the one hand, and on the other hand, protecting the public uh, from a threat. So that was one piece. Another piece um, that I found was the word social contagion uh, that was central to sociology at the turn of the 20th century, where um, people were talking about the contagion and this contagion was originally used um, about ideas, not germs. And so what the connection was between these anxieties of uh, bad behavior that um, people communicated to each other um, and how to think about that and what that meant in terms of, of um, how societies get held together. When it was positive, it was called communication. When it was negative, it was called social contagion. So how did that relate to the, the Typhoid Mary piece? And then finally, I came up with this idea of imagined immunities. Those of you who know Benedict Anderson's Imagined Communities will see what the pun is. That had been a very important uh, book for me. Um, uh, in uh, Constituting Americans. And I began to think of herd immunity as a public health fact, but also a social analog. And sociologists talk about social being, something we've all experienced during the pandemic, that we are social beings. We need each other. We need communication with each other. We can't, we're not isolados. And we, but at the same time, we represent a danger to each other. And that danger might be ideological and, and you know, violent. It also um, literally might be that we, you know, uh, the contagion that we're seeing, a virus. And so I see contagion as an analog for being human, which is why I think this concept has so much appeal and how it moves into the mythic direction. So I'm gonna skip the uh, turning, point, uh, turning points point, and I'm gonna end with um, how I end the uh, contagious. And I asked, what story do we want to tell? Do we want to tell a story about crisis and survival, like the one we're in? And when you're mid pandemic, sure we do, where vaccine and pharmaceuticals and quarantine are the should be our focus. Or when we're not in the midst of a threat, do we want to tell this as a story of how we want to live more responsibly and equitably in a global world? In other words, do we want to tell a story of medical science versus enemy microbes doing mythic battle for the fate of humanity or human beings acknowledging social responsibility for the world in which we all live together? And my last slide is how will we tell the story of COVID-19? And here's the thing I wish I had read. It, it was a piece that came out in Science in the year 2000, where Joshua Letterberg, again, scientist said, uh, he's talking about how we need to think differently about our interactions with our microbes and how we live with our microbes. And he said, you know, we need to understand that there are benevolent microbes and that we, our bodies are ecosystems and we should, you know, think more in terms of immunology and how to harness uh, the positive microbes. But then he says, our most sophisticated leap would be to drop the Manichaean view of microbes, we good, they evil, right? The us, them, the enemy, 
Perhaps one of the most important changes we can make is to supersede the 20th century metaphor of war for describing the relationship between people and infectious agents, a more ecologically informed metaphor, which includes the germ's eye view of infection might be more fruitful. And I wanna take his word ecologically much more broadly than he means it, right? So he's talking about the ecology of our bodies, but the ecology of, uh, ecologies of our bodies map onto the ecologies of our uh, geopolitics and our planet. And what I think Black Lives Matter so importantly taught us was the best way to start to think about the problem of COVID-19 and of uh, emerging infections generally is to begin with structural racism and to think about the, the inequities that are producing themselves worldwide or reproducing themselves worldwide. And again, those are the single biggest vectors that are responsible, and again, I can go into this in Q&A, that are responsible for our outbreaks and especially for uh, allowing our outbreaks not to be contained, to be turned into um, pandemics. And from there, to think about how we inhabit the planet together and how we can do so more justly. So I think Joshua Letterberg has given me the main metaphor I want to use moving forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Priscilla. This is the time when we would be like, yay, thank you so much for that talk. It was- Sorry to rush through that so much. No. Um, so, so here's the thing, and I, I, I should have maybe made this clear in the introduction. So um, there's a group of us who have been reading Contagious um, through the month of March. We've been gathering from four to five mountain time um, and reading different sections of Contagious. And I'd like to actually at this time ask Max Cassidy to um, turn on his camera because Max is going to be actually leading the, in the question period. Um, and he has been part of our book discussion group. And so let me just briefly introduce Max. Um, he's a lecturer in the English department here at um, CU Boulder and is finishing a PhD in English from Syracuse University. His dissertation, Novel Epidemics, explores representations of epidemic and metaphors of contagion in ethnic American literature. Max was well familiar with your book, Priscilla, before we selected it uh, for the Cox Family inaugural um, speaker series. So without further ado, Max, I'm going to turn things over to you to be the uh, main interlocutor for Priscilla. Well, thank you so much. And um, thank you to everyone in the book group and to Dr. Wald um, for this excellent opportunity. Um, so I sort of wanted to start right where you left off, Dr. Wald, um, with the conclusion of Contagious. Um, so you write um, in what I think is a really powerful ending to the book, um, Quote, amid the uncertainties about the forecasted pandemic, there is no doubt that it or any pandemic will affect the world's populations inequitably. The emerging stories can exacerbate or begin to address the inequities. They can make a difference. It's not only possible, but time to change the stories and the world they imagine. So what I would like to do is ask you, what might such stories look like? Uh, and what role can humanists and the humanities play in changing how we see or think about these outbreak narratives. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, Cause I, I dashed through that at the end and that that's what I was hoping to be able to get to a little more with, with more detail. Um, so I think first of all, one of the things that was so important to me about finding that Letterberg quotation was to find a scientist who was the guy who really you know got that conference together and got everybody thinking about this problem of disease emergence, saying the most important thing, like where we begin, is literally changing our metaphors. And you know, it's easy for me as a humanities person to say that. And as I said a couple of times in the talk, like, you know, people shrug and say it's a metaphor. Um, but it is how we organize our, our thinking. It's how a concept uh, takes hold. And I think his uh, saying that we need to stop thinking in terms of this us them, which is not just an us them us and the virus, but that goes back to a, a quotation I had of his earlier. It's us humanity versus nature as though we're not part of nature. So, you know, we really need to think about that for, you know, for one, but also, and that's why I, I really like the term ecology, 
because um, again, he's using it for the ecology of our bodies, right? The way that we have all these beneficial microbes and you know that, that our body works in conjunction with our microbes. Um, but I also wanna think about ecology in the broadest, most, you know, not even, not, not even the nature sense, but the broadest sense of how everything is interconnected and interdependent. And the, the inequities in our system, um, first of all, need to be addressed because they're wrong. But, but also addressing them, and this is where I'm getting, you know, why, why I think Black Lives Matter was so important. And so specifically, it wasn't incidental. Sure, it was in response you know, to the, the George Floyd, the trial of which started today, the George Floyd incident and the circulation of that video. But it was not an accident that that took hold during this pandemic, because I think the pandemic, a liminal moment in its own right, has been showing us all the things that are wrong with our system, all of our contradictions. And these inequities, both in the US and globally, um, are the first things we have to address if we want to think about addressing the conditions that have produced the pandemic. And again, I wanna be clear, we should address those issues because they are urgent in and of themselves, but also in the process of doing so, and this is what the Black Lives Matter analysis said, we will be addressing these larger issues. We will be inevitably addressing climate change and pandemics because it's all connected. And so that piece I feel was a missing piece from Contagious that I didn't have to, to really dig into how I would tell this story differently. And, um, and the urgency of addressing these issues worldwide, but, but starting for us with the US. Thank you so much for that answer. Yeah, um, one of the things we um, were thinking in the book group um, was certainly attending to um, race and poverty as um, really important factors in these um, outbreak narratives. Um, I. In the U.S., we often use this language uh, and sometimes the tools of epidemiology to think about systemic problems, which I think is what, what we're discussing right now. Um, opioid abuse, obesity, racism, I think have all been variously um, attached to these ideas of, you know, endemic or epidemic. Um, and in the wake of the recent shootings in Atlanta and, of course, in Boulder, I've been thinking about how that rhetoric of epidemic has been used to or invoked around um, gun violence. So is there a register in which we can, you know, the outbreak narrative and the other factors you study in the book um, might apply to these sort of non, you know, quote unquote contagious um, or like maybe non-disease um, aspects of epidemic as well? Um, yeah, and I want to, but I want to do that not as just a, an allegory, not an allegory, but like an analog, but actually the causation, mm -hmm. right? And I think, um, you know, everybody talks about how there are two pandemics, a pandemic of racism. You know, this came out of the Black Lives Matter movement, um, not the movement itself, but people writing about it. They talk about the two pandemics, one racism and one, um, you know, the COVID. And I want to make sure when we talk about two pandemics that we are understanding them as part and parcel of the same pandemic. And that's what I'm trying to get at, that one of the, the really brilliant analyses to come out of Black Lives Matter, the organizers, are they talk about how if you begin to address structural racism, and I prefer structural to systemic, because systemic is this contemporary thing. Structural tells us that it has a whole history, right? There is a whole legacy. This is built in to the structures of our, uh, of our government. And again, this is both in the US and worldwide with different manifestations in different locations. And they talk about if you begin to address these inequities, uh, inadequate healthcare, you know, we should have universal access to primary healthcare, um, health issues, broadly speaking, access to clean water, access to good air, not living near a toxic waste dump, you know, environmental racism, all of those things. If you begin to address structural racism, 
you find that every aspect of the injustice of our society starts to get addressed and everyone would be better off, you know, if, you know, because we'd be addressing the climate, because we'd be addressing the conditions that produce pandemics, if we move systematically um, through the inequities that, that are named by structural racism. So when, I, when, I, when we use that metaphor, I wanna be sure that we're not seeing it as separate from the pandemic, as twin pandemics, as people say, but much more as two expressions of the same problem, which if we go back and back and back, starts with structural racism. This to me is so interesting because um, it seems as if the, um, the notion, or I think maybe the truth of, of structural inequality and structural racism and the structural factors um, that lead to pandemics is somewhat in tension with this um, narrative emerge of emergence that's been so important um, both to your work and in sort of the popular genre fiction through which um, you read this and, you know, emergence, um, the sort of um, eco horror and um, disease horror that are, are you know, the, the scariness of these narratives seems really important both to um, the story they're trying to sell, but also their popularity. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I wonder, does that, you know, present a problem for counter, you know, a counter narrative um, that it doesn't have those sort of, um, you know, shock horror um, type of um, visceral imagery that that draws in audiences. You know, if we're trying to tell a counter narrative, um, you know, is there is there a, um, a a danger that it won't be picked up in the same way that that countervailing narrative is? Yeah, and that's the danger of any sensationalizing, right? That that you make something, um, you know, really seem like. I mean, you, yeah, you disconnect it from the. You know, so so to go back for a second, it's much easier to say, let's let's get this, um, let's get this. Uh, sorry, I'm losing my train of thought. Let's get this. Um, the the problem. Let's let's. Well, okay. Let's deal with the crisis. That's what I'm trying to say. Let's deal with the crisis. Let's talk about the immediacy of our survival. Let's get people vaccinated. Let's, you know, get get everyone in quarantine. I mean, again, those are really important things as we have experienced. If you're in the middle of a pandemic, but then my concern is when when we're past this, and we will be past this, people are going to want to forget, and it's much harder to deal with the, as you say, less sexy, less immediate. Crisis is both immediate and if we're talking about it in, in, you know, in art, in genre fiction and film and whatever, sexy, right? It's not sexy to be living through, but, but you know, the, the film is exciting and sexy and keeps our attention, adrenaline's flowing. And that's why I said, it's not gonna be interesting to watch a cold move through the world, right? Um, but, how do you represent, as you're asking, these much deeper problems and keep them in mind? And that's really the challenge that I've been looking at. And that's why I think if we go back to, well, so and let me, let me pick up, let me circle back to the first question and pick up another element of it. What are the narratives that we tell about our relationship with nature? Let's think about Darwin for a minute. We talk about, uh, at life being competition, war, um, uh, struggle, right? All these terms and that whoever wins the struggle in evolution is the one that survives. And then that's very quickly imported to society. What if we change those metaphors and there's a lot, and I'm gonna come back to the sexy question. I'm, I'm not leaving it entirely. Sorry, I know I'm taking a digression. But what if we, Think about what some scientists are doing right now, which is they're looking at cooperation and the ways in which cooperation, even more than competition, is most valuable for the survival of a species or whatever, learning to cooperate, right? What if that became our central metaphor? How might our central metaphor 
allow us to think differently about the world, not only in terms of solving problems, but in terms of what we find sexy and interesting, right? There's something about the way, I think, the way, and this is what I'm writing about now, the way that we define life as struggle, war, competition, battle, that, may, that has that survival crisis immediacy to it. And we have not conditioned ourselves, I think, as a society, and I'm, that we is very broad. There are societies that are different, right? But, but generally, uh, worldwide, have we conditioned ourselves enough to find interesting the day to day. You know, like Jen Jennifer and I were talking at the beginning about how beautiful things look right now. I mean, what if that becomes a way of appreciating the world and something that grabs attention? What would, what would that look like? And I know I'm being very kind of vague here, but I, this is what I'm trying to work through right now. And actually this is a good moment to say, this is how things like get started. You, you have a kind of amorphous question. You're not quite sure where it's going, but this question has been obsessing me for a couple of years and I'm slowly working towards being able to articulate it better than I can today. So that's, that's how I would answer that question is changing our metaphors and our narratives. And with that, perhaps changing the way we think about the world and and what we expect from art and and our stories and what gets us what gets our juices flowing it doesn't have to be crisis and survival i don't think i find that so compelling i uh it gets me thinking about how we might shift the sort of you talk about immunity as this battlefield and that metaphor being so um you know harmful to how we think about immunity and i think it's interesting to put that intention with how our immune systems actually operate and it's of course not this pitched battle but a system of exchange and um constantly um you know being permeable to the environment and th that metaphor you know maybe not as sexy but very um compelling counter narrative there. I do want to get a question that um, came up in the uh, Q&A. Um, this is from Caleb Wexler. He, um, he asks, uh, when you write the interactions that make us sick also constitute us as a community, does this, in the case of zoonotic diseases, um, animal born diseases, uh, include our interactions with no the non-human? So does contagion show that humanity is part of the same community um, as the non-human? Love human animal interactions. Absolutely. Great question. And absolutely. Yes. Which is why ecology is such an important metaphor because ecology encompasses everything, certainly all living organisms. So, you know, how we interact with plants, microbes, viruses, um, each other, all of that, that is the whole and thinking about those interactions and, and Max picking up on what you just said, thinking about those interactions as exciting and fascinating and engaging. Um, I think, you know, I think that I'm really interested in what, how that might work and what could happen. And I, I see it happening in art. You know, I think that there's, um, we're not only in for the adrenaline rush, you know, there, there are films that have been, that have been very slow moving um, that really, took hold of people's imagination. Um, uh, there was one called, I think it was called Arj, Arjua. No, I can't remember. Um, oh, it was a film um, done by uh, an Inuit film, Inuit, ah, Atanarjuat. Thank you, Toma. Uh, Atanarjuat, um, the fast, run, fast runner, the slow runner, the fast runner. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Sorry, I didn't remember that. And it was this amazing film that was like three hours long where there were just long stretches of really slow things happening that and it was just phenomenal and people loved it. And, you know, it's a different mindset, right? And it's also like, if you think about how popular yoga has been during the pandemic, um, the move periodically to Eastern religions and their popularity um, in the West, um, all of these are indications of the fact that we are looking for different ways of being in the world. But so to go back to Caleb's question, absolutely the way we interact with animals and plants, and I'm not necessarily advocating eating bats. Um, 
you know, I know it's a delicacy, but that I have, you know, real questions about until we understand better, you know, what's going on with bats. Um, so I'm not, I'm not saying, you know, everything goes, but, but certainly the way we inhabit the planet and, um, and, and interact again with all living organisms, including our viruses, um, paying more attention to, uh, in all the ways that, um, uh, environmental justice asks us to. Um, another question from uh, the Q and A here is from Toma, um, and I think this is a this is a question that we're all thinking, uh, and I'm sure you've answered um, quite a few times over the last year. Which is, um, are you interested in, or is there any interest in um, perhaps a new um, edition of Contagious, or perhaps with a new forward, or um, revisiting Contagious um, in light of COVID and post COVID? Um, and some of these questions that we've been talking about today. Um, and then another question um, to follow that up, which is which writing about COVID um, have you found to be compelling and do you have any recommendations? Um, okay, so first question, Duke Press has asked me that in many different <laughs> ways <laughs> and forms. And I thought about it um, and I even sort of, you know, I thought about it really seriously over the summer and I just, I, I, I did a bunch of writing on COVID because individual people were asking me to do that updating. And I've promised a few more pieces to friends and, and uh, you know, that, that I said I would do. Um, but I really wanna get back to the other book, which I've been working on. And by the way, one of the things I wanted to say about Contagious was that I started working on that book in 1995. It came out in 2008. So if anyone thinks that, you know, it was a fast write, it was not. And the current project I started, you know, shortly after Contagious, and I'm still working on, um, and uh, COVID has changed it. So that's my answer to that. COVID has changed it, and I'm going back with a new um, set of questions and perspectives. But I, but I don't. I've said what I wanted to say in Contagious, and in the couple of updates um, that I've done, and I don't have anything more to say. And uh, what have I read that's good on COVID? I, there's been a lot, but I'm drawing a blank. I'm so sorry, I'm drawing a blank. If you email me, I'll try to go back to like the piles of things I have. Um, there's, there's nothing that is immediately popping into my head, but I know there's a lot of good stuff that's been written, including journalism. There's been some really excellent, uh, smart journalism. And, and I think the Black Lives Matter uh, work has been fantastic. You know, it's more journalistic than academic, um, but I'm not sure we need such a strong distinction there when it's responsible journalism. Uh, Lori Garrett has been doing some fabulous work on this. Um, yeah. Excellent. I think that's a really great starting point and perhaps uh, a good ending point here for our Q&A. So uh, thank you to Dr. Wald and thank you. Uh, to all the questioners and I will hand it back over to Jennifer. Hi everyone. So thank you everyone who's been watching on Facebook Live. Thank you for people who watch the recording. And of course, thank you to everyone who is here in the Zoom webinar with us. Um, we actually do have um, a part two as a little special treat for people who've been reading the book Contagious. And so you should have gotten an email, um, although we're gonna take a small break, but um, just a warm round of applause in whatever way you wanna indicate. Um, to Priscilla Wall that we've just so enjoyed hearing this talk. I'm so grateful that you are our inaugural speaker. Um, and I think that'll do it. So I hope everyone is safe um, and taking care of themselves. And I'm just so grateful to the CHA staff, which I have to really give a huge shout out to. Um, I don't think they wanna come off camera, but Kat Lewis, uh, Sharon Van Boven, and Danny Urbina, because there is no CHA without the incredible CHA staff. So um, take care, everybody.